Welcome back to The Accidental Writer at the Alex Cafe. I'm Susan Berg. And I'm Dick Gross. Today we're going to focus on the publishing and printing industry. We're going to start with Martin Hughes from Affirm Press, who shares with us the details of taking a book to the international market. He also talks about how the audio books have really opened up the market and have brought in new readers. And we're also going to talk once again to um, Michael Hanrahan from Publishing Central. He uh, runs a business that helps uh, writers, novelists, etc., self-publish and hit the self-publishing market. So he's got insights too, and he's going to be talking about selling on Amazon because it's a huge market to the world. It's also a place where some books go to die. And he's going to try and tell us how that doesn't have to be the consequence for your particular publication. So we hope you enjoy the show. But some books just transcend the Australian market. Yeah. The classic one is Pip's book on the or original Oxford Dictionary. Yeah. That goes to the English-speaking world. Yeah. But beyond the English-speaking world, that book goes to people who are interested in women. Absolutely, yeah. And, the, uh, and um, gender power games. Yeah. So... I suppose the point I, I want to try and tease out is about when do you decide that something transcends the Australian market? Well, that's a good example. So when we say that we're focusing on the Australian market, we absolutely are. We are somewhat expert now in selling into the Australian market. When we have a great book, like the Dictionary of Lost Words and lots of other books we've had, we then try and sell the rights to those books to international publishers because they're going to do a better job publishing it in their Absolutely. market but you'll than, make than much we would from money. here. We make much less money, but the author doesn't, and that's part of part of our service to the author. You know, we've had lots of uh, lots of successful international rights deals, um, and um, uh, yeah, it, it it can be it can be a huge thing to um, for an author's career because when then they see how small the Aussie market is. Yeah. Is it the US that's US is is, is is ginormous. Yeah. I mean, it's ten times the population, um, and uh, and they've ten times the GDP. Yeah. So what what are the digital books? What about how, how is that affected with with people reading, and does that entice people to read more, or is it affected? Yeah. Look, the e-books was um, there was a huge thing uh, about ten years ago. It was going to be the death of the paper book, um, this, that, and the other, and it's it, just it, not true. But it hasn't it, been, has it, it? I mean, yeah, it went on a very steep tra trajectory, and then um, uh, we were thinking, you know, well, like if paper book disappeared and there's only e-books, it'd be much easier for small publishers to get into the game. Mm. Because paper books require economies of scale to actually be um, to, to, to be viable, but ebooks climbed steeply and then plateaued. Right. The biggest thing in our market over the last few years is audio books. Okay. Yes, that's true. Yeah. They they're going gangbusters, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. And the great thing about audio books is that um, it's it's been demonstrated now in uh, in the data that it's not so much readers of paper books going over to audio books. It's new, new readers. It's newies, is it? Yeah, and so that's that's a, that's a terrific new. The market. few actors I know, yeah, their only jobs that they're getting now is audio books. Yeah, absolutely. It opens up to people. You know, I've got a girlfriend of mine who's an ultra marathon runner, and she spends her time running, listening to books. Yeah. So obviously you couldn't used to, yeah. you know, hold a book and, no, and run true. at the same yeah, time. So true. it opens up a new market there as well for well, yeah. people that don't actually like reading, but they want to... Absolutely. I mean, like, people like me, I mean, honestly, I got a new pair of glasses a couple of weeks ago. I couldn't believe the difference it made. <laughs> I kept falling asleep after uh, after getting to the bottom of a page. I was thinking, well, that manuscript's obviously rubbish. So <laughs> I kind of keep me awake. But it's just, I was so tired from reading. Mm. And some people find it very taxing reading. Yeah. And so getting their books uh, via a, uh, a narrator is, is, is the way for them, and it's the way for us to, to reach a bigger audience with our authors. So mm. we love it. You've got, well, they first of all say that every person has a book in them. Do yeah. you think that's true? Uh, yeah, probably do. It might not be a very good book. And from there, next question is, what advice would you give people that have written one and 
yeah. want to get it published, what would well, the advice be? Like I touched on earlier on, I would definitely uh, look at the market and see what already works. When we sell a book to a, uh, a, a retailer, it needs to fit a category. When we're selling it, they think, oh, oh yeah, it'll be like such and such, that sells well. It'll go on that category, it'll go on that shelf. If you come up with something experimental or that falls between categories, it's too hard. Okay, so if you're going to write a thriller, write a bloody thriller. Don't set out to write a, a, a high concept um, literary um, thriller which kind of crosses over different genres. Just give, the, give the, the, the market what it needs to get yourself started. What it's used to. You know? And memoirs are really, really difficult to, uh, to, to make successful unless you've got a, um, uh, an existing kind of brand and following. Really, really difficult. So it's got to be an exceptional story like yours, or it's got to be exceptionally well written that will just knock people's socks off. And even books like, um, what was it called? I forgot what it was called. There's a book uh, a few years ago, um, The Erratics, uh, which, beautiful book, came out with a small publisher, didn't do much at all, and then won a prize, got picked up by a big pu publisher, went huge. Okay, it's the same book. But if it hadn't been picked up by a big publisher, it never would have been heard of. You could spot the good books on Amazon. A few years ago, they brought in a new rule about the quality control of the book. So 10 years ago, you could upload anything to Amazon. It could be full of spelling mistakes, full of typos. It didn't matter. They brought in some new rules a few years ago, and a lot of authors' books got taken down. So um, none of ours, because they yeah. were properly produced. But um, you know, a lot of authors had their books taken off Amazon when they introduced new standards. I mean, the things to keep in mind to sell on Amazon are, if you've got a social media presence, that kind of thing, that's really important these days. Um, it doesn't matter what platform you're on, or how you're distributing the book, it's very important to be active with it. So be out there promoting it, like I mentioned, our authors getting on TV, that kind of thing. Um, Amazon's just a channel. Um, it's the same as having your book in bookstores, all that kind of thing. If you're not out there marketing and promoting the book, it's mm. not going to sell. Mm. So, you know, the biggest, the big thing for a lot of our authors these days is social media. Um, it depends on the book, what the best social media is for them. So we had an author a little while ago who'd, um, who'd written a book about um, overcoming eating disorders and she was big on Instagram. So Instagram was great for her. Whereas our business authors, mostly LinkedIn is really good for them. Um, That's true. Yeah, a lot of authors do Facebook these days. Yeah. So social media is very big for authors these days. Um, so one of the things that traditional publishers are starting to do a lot is they're expecting authors to do more of their own promotion these days. So it's actually, Funnily enough, that's actually driving a lot of authors more towards self-publishing because they go to a traditional publisher and the traditional publisher says, what are you going to do to market the book? And right. the author says, well, if I'm doing all the marketing, you know, why am I coming to you? So, yeah, that's something that's changed a lot in the last few years. Yeah, and it is expensive and difficult to get a book out. Mm. Yeah, you know, actually that, I had professional people who all have to be paid for. Yeah, actually producing it's the easy bit. So we warn our authors of that, that, that actually putting the book together is the easy part. Um, you know, getting out there and using it well in the world is the challenge. What is the kind of cost to have a book self-published? Um, well, I mean, there's the, the I spectrum. Say, what's the investment? Yes, is that's the, the word we use as well, what's the investment? <laughs> um, our average package is a twelve to $15,000. So that's, for, that's an author comes to us with a word file and they've got a printed book in their hands three months later. Um, so that's the so, time frame, yeah, three months three from months beginning to from end? Three months from word file to book in your hands, mm -hmm. yep. So that's, that's for an average book, about 40,000 words, something like that. Um, you can literally self-publish a book for free these days on Amazon. Um, I certainly wouldn't advise it. They're probably all the ones that got taken down when Amazon mm -hmm. cleans things up a bit. But there is a whole community out there of people doing this themselves and doing it for free and like just getting a friend who's halfway good at graphic design to do a cover for them. And you can literally do it for free if you want to. But you know, then you, you get the result that you, you get when you do things for free. So. My, my little experience in doing this is that the people who do the design of the pages are very sophisticated. There's a lot more to it than people expect, mm. and it's an it's area It's not just a word file. No, it's, it's not even done in Microsoft Word. Um, so this is an area, not the authors we work with, but this is an area we see authors turn their books absolutely into porridge. It's, they, the common process is something like, um, I'll get my web designer to do the interior line design. He's a great designer. Or, you know, I'll get my photographer knows how to use InDesign, which is the program we use. I'll get him to do my interior layout. And it just becomes an absolute mess. And um, we had a book a little while ago that, we, that the author had done themselves and we we're trying to help them out. And we sent, to the, sent it to the printer. The printer actually sent it back and said, we can't print this. It was that much of a mess. So yeah, the interior layout's a lot more complicated than people think. It's very, very hard to do it well. 
So, Mick, you're a, uh, uh, not a printer, you're a print broker. Yeah. But you come up with these beautiful products. Um, tell us the difference between a print broker and a printer. I actually sell four, I sell four printers. I sell, um, whether it be a calendar or a book or a, a poster, it could be a run of handbills, but I haven't done that in particular for a long time. I've, uh, since the last couple of years, I've been concentrating on publishing books for people, just short run books. Um, the technology these days has allowed it to, to become something that's very available to just about anyone on the street that wants to write. So tell us about the, the, the technology. Can I just mm. um, foreshadow this by saying back in the day, uh, if you got something published, mm. they would say, look, because of the need to defray costs and get economies of scale, you've got to have a minimum print run of 2,000 books. Well, correct, correct. Like that would be going on to a web offset press where, you know, the, they'd be coming out in sections as well, which would have to be stitched then rebound into the cover, whether it be a, a soft cover like this or in a hard cover. So yeah, um, just to set up the machinery, the plate costs and everything else, obviously was a, a, a big expense. Now with digital printing, it's basically, you know, you snapshot the PDF and so print from that. Brought down know? the printing cost plus, that means then that the well, author doesn't have to pay or well, have correct. so many book runs. Well, instead of 2,000, for instance, uh, we print fi minimums of 50. Right. So anyone can have their home story, say it's the family's history or whatever, you only want 50 or 100 books printed. You, know, you can do that for under $1,000 these mm. days. And that flexibility is possible with digital? Yes, it makes it very, very possible. And also the stock quality, Dick. You'll notice your, your old school um, novels, they've got more like a, um, a news press type of paper, sometimes a little bit you know, higher quality, but still very porous. The quality of the paper you can use in digital printing is a, a great That's advance as well. So what about the um, turnaround time? Does it, I'm presuming well, that it's, it's a lot magic. quicker it's with magic. that as well? I mean, once I've got the cover art and the, the InDesign files for the, the copy of the book, I can have one printed within two days. Mm, okay. So... But I like a week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just to make myself sound like a total old bastard, um, not like you do. <laughs> it's not like me, but I am an old bastard. And um, I think for the growing world of publishing where uh, it's sort of more targeted mm. and, you know, people want products to be um, less mass produced because they're not going to be a mass novelist anymore, well, they can do stuff. Yeah, that's the point. I mean... Back in the day, and I've still got friends who are who are authors that have got boxes and boxes of books that mm. haven't sold. You know, and I think that's I as have. well. That's me. Okay. <laughs> I think so as well. It's not just because you know, with the whole industry is changing, so it's correct. not just printed books anymore. People are getting the audio books or mm. their um, digital books. Yeah. So the need for the printed book has reduced. Yeah. To some degree, yes. Um, I don't think that's so much the the issue. I mean, if someone digs an audio book, they're going to go and buy, you know, possibly a hard cover of that if they can get it, if they love the book that much, you know, so they're, they're still very much collectibles. It's like listening to a song on Spotify. That's not going to stop you from buying the track or buying a CD if you're at a live gig. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I don't have Spotify and, you know. Well, if it's <laughs> similar. It's <laughs> well, re points. relate that to, like, <laughs> instead of a radio station, yeah. digital, digital um, music, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the growth of merch. Mm. So people, if people love an artist, they want something tangible in their hands, even if it's a T-shirt they'll never wear again, or, um, yeah. or, or the actual book so they can treasure it. And I know mm. when I have a book finished and published, the tangible thing of holding mm. it in your hand is a... It's very much a, it's a spiritual I, moment. I find that when I hand the books to, to new authors and, and those that are just getting the book off me for the first time. The excitement. Oh, yeah. It's sort yeah. Of like ha it's happened. All their My dreams, dream has finally, come true. it's happened. It's there. It's, yeah. I can see it. I can hold it. I can actually read it. What's wrong with that? What have you done? <laughs> you, you get a bit of that too, but you know. Um, magazines are also, you don't have to go to the full, you know, um, perfect bound type of binding you know, for books for a, a, a different type of project. It could be like um, 
your book on, on woodcraft or, or if you're a tradesman. And this one, Cocktails Down Under. Or workbooks you could cocktails do. Cocktails from Down Under. Well, that's mm. ours, mate. That's <laughs> mine. <laughs> OK. Yeah. You've got a weakness for cocktails. No, we published it in 1972 and it was a very rare book and I found a, a, a very good copy of it, scanned it all and decided, to, re uncle. decided to reprint it. Well, it's come that up magic. means for all you potential authors out there, there's now options and you don't have to go to a publisher. You no. don't have to um, do print runs of two, three thousand. 3,000. No. no. There's flexibility. There's a lot of flexibility. Um, books, 50 at a time for around $11 a piece. Fabulous. Yeah. Mm. Thanks very much, Mick. My pleasure, Dick. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Susan. Mm, thanks. One of the things that you have been actively exploring for the last mm. probably couple of years is um, exploring Jewish mysticism through mm. poetry and spoken word. And we haven't got time in an interview such as this to go into the, the long and rich history of Jewish mysticism, which goes back at least a few millennia. But <laughs> probably, could, yeah. <laughs> could you give us like a, a brief rundown of the main things that you're trying to tackle mm. in that? I mean, the first and most obvious is that Jewish mysticism posits that everything in reality is created from words mm -hmm. and that words generate reality and words are the substance of reality and through words you form reality. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these mystics believe it's literal, like literally physical reality is formed out of words, but I, I prefer to take it as human consciousness is uh, mediated and... Um, you know, expressed through language. Mm -hmm. And that the language that we use generates our consciousness on a, on a very simplistic level. If you continually use positive language, you'll feel somewhat positive. If you continually use negative language, put yourself down, put others down, use that negativity, you yourself will start to feel negative and, you know, so on and so forth and so forth. So given that poetry is the art of words themselves mm -hmm. and not simply the meaning of words but the sound of words and the feeling of words and the way literally the vibratory um, weight or, or frequency of a word actually interfaces with the emotional makeup of a person to me this was this was jewish mysticism mm -hmm. like th this is this was precisely the thing the kabbalah was talking about so right. i saw my poetic work as a as a form of mysticism as taking words and then rearranging them and moving them and and putting them in different combinations and just seeing how does that affect another person um, by relaying those words to them and then letting them sit in their consciousness and see how it transforms. So it, it appeared to me that poetry on a stage is a magical and, and theurgic activity in and of itself, whether okay. before yeah. you're even bringing in any mysticism consciously, anybody that's getting up that has sat and literally like worked with words as a material of formation, mm. um, they're practicing a, a form of mysticism on the stage. Yeah, the whole history of um, basically ritual mm. through words and incantation mm. and chanting and I mean, it's rich in, in oh, human well, history, it's not just it's not just Judaism, no, it's, of course it's all not. the way through yeah. many different cultures. Yeah, I mean, and you know. I think you've struck on a very rich vein in, mm. in, in choosing to mm. address the faith that you come from and the, the actual ritual and yeah, magic process of mm. poetry. I mean, I know we live in a world where there's a lot of skepticism and atheism, <laughs> yeah. but j music has that power. Well, and, I mean, and so I, does poetry. Yeah, I don't think mm. you have to be a believer in no, God to, no. um, you know, some of my favorite artists are atheists. Mm. Um, yeah, the, the, the belief in whatever's out there to me is sort of irrelevant to yes. the actual process of um, yeah, using language to alter consciousness, I suppose is the most precise way of putting it. Yeah, well, I mean, lots of people try and do that in all sorts of ways. Yeah. The mass media, advertising, well, exactly. political I mean, advertising, propaganda. It, yeah, precisely. Yeah, yeah. They're all forms of, of word magic. Yeah, that are but poetry used. is a, a particular form that really delves deeply into human well, consciousness. Well, my thing with poetry is that 
and people often ask me, you know, what's the difference between prose and poetry? And mm -hmm. I say in prose, it, the meaning of the words is what's important. So the words themselves are less important as long as you're conveying the meaning that, that you, you wish to convey. Mm -hmm. Whereas in poetry, it's the artistry of the words themselves, how they look on a page, how they sound in, in speech, uh, how they, they, you know, cadence off each other, how they rhyme with each other or dissonate off each other. It's, it's, a, it's an artistry of the sound of words itself. And um, so that's why poetry is really the purest of these, you know, word manipulation mm -hmm. art forms and, and art and uh, sorry, uh, advertising, propaganda, et cetera. They're all extensions of what, what I believe the core is what we mm -hmm. call poetry. It's been great having you on the show, Yoram. It's been awesome being here. Yep. Thank okay. you. Okay. All the best to you. So last night I put on a pair of virtual reality glasses and I sat down in the International Space Station, and I looked down on planet Earth on an utterly mind-blowing view, to float there above the planet, to look at it, watch it, wonder at it, behold it and hold it in the eye of the mind and the mind of the eye, there it is, the homeland of all of us, the only planet that any of us live on. And like Superman said, when I fly above the planet, I don't see borders, just one single planet. And now we're all supermans. We're all getting the power to fly through space, go to places, through our technologies that no one before us has ever conceived. And last night, with a piece of electronic gadgetry, I peered through the limitations of reality. I got a tiny glimpse of the actuality that we're all on one single planet. Now, I've seen a sunrise many times. Each day the sun rises, each day the sun's rays break through to the end of the night, each day we witness anew the creation of the light. And as the world wakes up and the sun paints her in colours, every artist and poet and romantic and lover is filled with deep wonder and a part of their soul wants to cry out impulsively. But last night, sitting in my friend's kitchen, looking through those virtual reality glasses, I was witnessing a miracle greater than any sunrise I was watching an earth rise. For the galaxy is full of suns, but this blue-green earth, there's only this one, and we've all got to share it, because it's the only one that we've got. Each day I want to see an earth rise. I want to see this planet with my own eyes to look on down from the skies and realize that we've got to save this planet before she dies. I want you to see an earth rise. I want you to see this planet with your own eyes to look on down from the skies and realize that all together we're either going to live or we're all going to die. Because up in space we can all look down on our mother countries and our father lands, on our sacred deserts and river lands and all of the different holy lands. And whether you're black or white or yellow or brown, or male or female or any gender around every culture and nation that's ever appeared. All of the religions through all of the years are all bound together on this one single sphere and our only border is the atmosphere. Each day I want to see an earth rise. I want to see this planet with my own eyes to look on down from the skies and realize that we got to save this planet before she dies. And I want you to see an earth rise. I want you to see this planet with your own eyes, to look on down from the skies and realize that all together we're either going to live or we're all going to die. Miles Franklin have just announced their long list, which has 12 authors on the awards. Tell us a bit about it, Dick. Well, um, I think it's our premier literary award for fiction and I've never been on <laughs> <laughs> the long list, <laughs> let alone win it. But um, anyway, I'm not sure that either of us will ever get there. But mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm not jealous, so I'm going to speak about this with generosity of spirit. Right. Um, so the long list consists of 12, uh, 12 books. There are a couple of interesting things about this list. I won't go through the list because that's a bit boring. But the interesting thing for me is that one publisher, not a large publisher, text, publishing mm. in, um, in Melbourne, uh, text are interesting because they, um, they, we film in St Kilda and across the road is uh, St Kilda Primary and their kids went to St Kilda Primary and um, so, you know, their kids and our kids went to school together. But um, it's really uh, extraordinary that they've got three of the 12. 
That's fabulous, isn't it? It's really it is fabulous. Mm. And so Alan and Unwin and, and uh, Picador and, and, uh, are there. Picador have two. And Penguin, I don't see Penguin there, but uh, they might be there through another name. Um, so uh, it's interesting that this Melbourne pu Indigenous publisher uh, has got three of the 12 on the mm, longest. Mm, absolutely. And uh, the second thing is that there are some new names. And I suppose there's new names every year. And maybe there are some old names that didn't get in. So there's this cycling, recycling of, uh, um, of names. And one name that's caught a lot of uh, people uh, attention is um, the... Uh, 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 a sort of a, a memoir of, of a Creek migrant experience and that's by Andrew Pippos and that's been published by Picador. Hmm. I mean the role of, of these awards, I, I think it's all about book sales because I know I went through a stage where every time someone won an award I'd read the book. Well, you know, okay, it won yes, an yeah. award it must be good. I particularly did that with the Booker Prize, which is now the Man Booker Prize in, in England, and I've read quite a few of those. And so how have you found the books? Have, have you read them and felt that they were worthy of the award? Or Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not qualified to be a judge. I never would be a judge. And so it's hard because it's a comparative thing, who's better than the others. But I've always found it a rewarding read. Mm. You know, these are class people in a highly competitive arena. Um, uh, last year, the uh, award was the Miles Franklin went to Tara June Winch for her novel *The Yield*, and she was the fourth Indigenous writer to win. Mm. So um, there was a stage. There's been quite a few controversies with the Miles Franklin. Um, Miles Franklin is named after the author Miles Franklin, and her. Miles is her fourth name. She's got three other names in front of it. Her first name, I think, was Stella. So they created the Stella Awards for women writers. And um, so that's sort of... And, and when you look at this list, it's pretty gender neutral. And um, I haven't done the numbers, but I think it looks like the women have got the ascendancy this, this time around. The other big controversy, which you're too young to know about, but because I'm considerably oh, older than you. Yes, I'm way too young to <laughs> yeah, know. Way yes. too young. Yes. Was the Helen Demodenko, where a, a young woman who was a student at Queensland University pretended to be a Ukrainian refugee and wrote about her war experience and uh, called herself Demodenko when her real name was Helen Darvel. Um, so that was... a. A, a major drama that there was this sort of fraudulent approach to um, the authorship. Right. And um, I was just speaking before to Hamo, our poetry guru, and he said, well, look, they were sort of like deer in the headlights. They didn't react at all well. And I think there's another, um, another scandal approaching the Miles Franklin. Because if you go into Miles Franklin's history, she had very close connections to fascists prior to the war and wasn't a fan of Semites. And there were her, one of her um, close associates, Inky Stevenson, who was a Rhodes Scholar, he was, I think, incarcerated during the war, definitely got into trouble. But somehow, Miles Franklin, even though she had these odious views, escaped scrutiny and it is my duty to run a campaign on that. Right, okay. Is that something you've, you've literally put your hand up to, to yeah, do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I think so. And it's sort of like those slavers who had statues mm. about them and, and, they were, and, and their statues were pulled down in Birmingham, in Birmingham, Alabama and Birmingham, England. So. I don't know what you think about it. Oh, well, from my opinion, if people have been involved in slavery or any kind of thing where it's you know, maybe they're you know, 
child sex abusers or, or rapists or something, I don't think they should be glorified in any way. I don't think that they deserve to have a platform that puts them up on a pedestal. So if they get brought down, they get brought down. They'll, you know, no tears from me. So that's a strong view. The more conciliatory view would be to say, okay, let's put in a sign that says these people were slavers or Miles Franklin had a pretty dubious mm. history with the fascist movement prior to the war. Mm. Well, so, isn't that the wonderful thing about life is that we all get to have our own opinions and, well, that's right. and choose so, for ourselves. You'd, be, you'd take a hard line? I, yeah, I think I would. I kind of, no tolerance kind of yeah. um, thing from my point of view. But anyway, um, I think we'll, we'll leave it there in relation to this wonderful award and we'll keep you updated with how it progresses and we will endeavour to have And including my campaign, <laughs> Miles Franklin, fascist. <laughs> And we'll also endeavour to get some of these authors on our show so that you can keep up to date with their work. We'll see you soon.